Good morning, good morning, good morning. May God bless you. May God keep you. Thank you for uh, joining on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for, for God's grace and his mercy for allowing you to wake up and see another day today, to be able to come uh, into the knowledge and to the, uh, the understanding of who he is and that he is sitting on the throne, that he is looking over us, that he is watching over us each and every day, each and every moment of the day he is watching over us. So we want to thank God for him being with us once again today. Uh, this morning, April 18, 2021, we're going to get into Colossians once again, as we as we spoke a little bit on Colossians last week about the salutation, uh, Paul's salutation to uh, the church of Colossae, right? Uh, the faithful minister of Epaphras, right? This is what we're going to be talking about today. So looking at Colossians, the first chapter, Colossians, the first chapter. Good morning, Donnell. Uh, verses 24 through 29. Colossians, the first chapter. Verses 24 through 29. Colossians 1, 24 through 29. And I was thinking about a title once again today, and as I kept reading and studying, I was like, man, this is all about, as I stated last week, rejoicing in the struggle. And I said, should this be rejoicing in the struggle part two, you know? Or should it be conversations to create change? And then I I kind of focused on conversations to create change. Maybe that's what this is all about conversations to the church of Colossae through a letter written by Paul while he is uh, incarcerated, while he is in bonds in Rome, writing this letter to the church of Colossae, right? So maybe it's all about conversations to create change. Hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you once again for allowing uh, the Holy Spirit to wake us up today, that our that our eyes just crack wide open as the sun uh, begin to shine and, and peep through our windows. And as we begin to hear the birds sing and uh, and look up and see blue skies and, and be able to know, Lord Jesus, it's, it's only because of you that my heart is still pounding today and that, that there is breath still in my body, that I'm still able to breathe only because of you, that I'm able to see, that I'm able to hear and feel and touch only because of you. And I thank you, Lord, for the love that is still within my heart. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world today, that the love of God, the Holy Spirit still rests within me, within us today. That's the most important aspect of our Christian ministry today, that the Holy Spirit is still with us, that we don't have a a spirit of hate in, in our hearts, that we have a spirit of love and compassion and empathy. So we thank God once again for his grace and his his mercy today. So, Lord, I pray that a message will fall from the skies. I pray that it will come from you and not from me, Lord. So bless us and keep us on this beautiful Sunday morning. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Colossians, the first chapter, 24 through 29. Okay. Conversations to create change, right? And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure, Isaiah 33 and 6. One thing that stood out this week, there's a lot that has happened in, this, in these past few days, in this past week. Uh, but I, I, I heard a correspondent speak on, on CNN. She was leaving CNN. And one thing that stood out in her final message, Brooke Baldwin on CNN, her last message was, get a little uncomfortable, speak up, and keep pushing. Hmm. And that resonates with this message today, right? Get a little uncomfortable, speak up and keep pushing, keep pushing, keep moving forward. Get a little uncomfortable, right? In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord, be a little uncomfortable, right? Speak up and keep pushing. Hmm. So our message today is, is so deep. There's so much in this passage of scripture today when we look at 24 through 29 of the book of Colossians. Remember, as we picture Paul sitting, sitting at a table, maybe uh, sitting w- with a soldier or two soldiers by his side, right? And he's writing this letter to this church, right? Because he has heard, Epaphras has came to him. He has visited him. Epaphras has had these conversations with him about who was Jesus Christ? What did he do? Really? He rose again on the third day. He, he knocked you off your horse on the Damascus road, right? You used to incarcerate, you used to throw men, women, and children in prison in the name of Jesus Christ. Tell me a little bit more about Jesus Christ. So that's what this is all about. It's a, it's, it's a fight, right? It's a fight. And then I was reading a few moments ago (laughs) about uh, James Baldwin, right? James Baldwin, one of the uh, uh, one of of the best uh, articulate uh, writers of our time. In one of his articles, he stated, any writer, I suppose, and this 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 uh, uh, meets uh, what we're going to be talking about today. 
So work with me for a moment. And this is what he says as we think about the Apostle Paul. He says, any writer, I suppose, feels that the world into which he was born is nothing less than a conspiracy against the civilization, civilization of his talent. Okay, keep him Paul in your mind, right? Which attitude and certainly has a great deal to support it. On the other hand, it is only because the world looks on his talent with such a frightening indifference that the artist is compelled to make his talent important. So that any writer looking back over even so short a span of time as I am here forced to assess finds that the things which hurt him and the things which helped him cannot be divorced from each other, right? He could be helped in a certain way only because he was hurt in a certain way. Thinking about Paul, he can be helped in a certain way only because he was hurt in a certain way. Us as believers, us as Christians, right? We, 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 we can only be helped in a certain way because we were hurt in a certain way. We found Jesus Christ uh, because we were hurt in a certain way. So now we are helped in a certain way in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And this help is simply to be enabled, right, to move from one a conundrum to the next one is tempted to say that he moves from one disaster to the next isn't that like us as christians today we're moving from one disaster to the next but because of god's grace and mercy we are able to stand we don't give up and just throw in the towel and say you know what forget it i don't want to have anything to do with this anymore I, I, there's no more fight left in me but the holy spirit allows us to keep moving forward amen donnell so here we go one is tempted to say that he moves from one disaster to the next. We move from one disaster to the next, but then we look, but, but, but then we look back and say, how did I make it through? Only because God's grace and his mercy that I made it through that disaster. So this is just like Paul moving from one event to the next, moving through the pain, the healing, right? Just long enough to move on to, to open wounds, right? Uh, of people rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He is moving from one direction to another. He was almost killed on several occasions. He was shipwrecked, right? He was, he was, he was flogged at, at, uh, on the synagogue steps. He was, he was beaten within an inch of his life on many occasions in the name of Jesus Christ, moving from one conundrum to the next. Hmm. Therefore, we are troubled on every side, right? That's what the scripture says. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Amen. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down but not destroyed, always hearing, right? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. Isn't that what this is all about? Isn't that what this is all about? So the writer begins by saying that life alone is but a conspiracy, going back to James Baldwin. Life itself is nothing but a conspiracy, right? Against what we, born, what we were born to do in the first place, okay? Bear with me. Once we discover our true talent, we begin to use that talent as a means to make ourselves better. We begin to use that talent, right? That, that, that undiscovered, undiscovered talent to make ourselves better, right? To make others better, to plant something people have seen within us, right? Or in the next person, right? So the cycle continues, right? The, the conspiracy in trying to find what we are gifted to do and using that gift to, to promote what is good, to promote what is true, is the only mechanism we have in moving God's faith and promoting God's hope, right? That we continue to use those precious gifts that we have, right? No matter big or small, that we use that gift, whether it's two fish and five loaves of bread, right? Whatever that gift is, that we use that gift, right? for the promise of Jesus Christ. Okay, so yes, the conspiracy lives on, amen, right? The conspiracy that leads us away from the simple thinking to something, right, that is much broader than ourselves, to come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thinking about this letter, y'all, to the, to the Church of Colossae, right? Because what it is, as, as, we, as we hear lawyers speak on television, right? There's, you know, there's a defense to something that is true or something or there's a defense to something that is not true. And us as believers, we are all attorneys, right? Speaking on the defense of Jesus Christ. Paul is speaking to the church of Colossae in defense of Jesus Christ. This is what you got yourself into. Amen. God has uh, poured a sprinkling of his blood out on you. He has blessed you. He is, he is with you. Uh, all you have to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or in, 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 in the Mediterranean region, that God has died for you and me forevermore. Hmm. Rejoicing in the struggles when God asks you, right, 
No, requires you to use the gifts, right? Use the gifts that you have to promote the spiritual well-being of unbelievers, right? God is forcing us in a loving way to divorce from the unrighteousness of this world, right? To discover peace, right? To stumble and not fall, to fall and get back up again, to fail and to, and to succeed, right? And to once again fail and succeed again, to fail and succeed again through the strength that Christ has laid aside for us to overcome. So, so though we fail, we get back up again, we fail, we stumble, we get back up again, that we ask God, you know, help me back up again once more because I know that you carried me from the last incident. You, I stumbled before, but you are blessing me once again. Therefore, we are troubled on every side and yet not distressed. Hmm. So what we find in this passage today, I'm very excited about this passage today, is that Paul recognizes that his true gift is that of a minister. Hmm. Uh, an apostle, a servant of Jesus Christ. If you, it, it, when you read the when, when you read the writings of Paul, what you find is someone who is uh, he he continues to diminish his title as he moves forward. He can, continues to diminish his title as he moves forward uh, uh, or gets closer to his to his death. Right? You know, I, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Right? But now I am a servant to Jesus Christ, and I count that as joy. Right? That I'm now a servant to Jesus Christ. Not only an apostle, right, or a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now I am a servant. That means I have reached the highest pinnacle of Christianity. That I have become a servant to you, Kent Hatzel. So what we find in this passage today, right, is that Paul recognizes that his true gift, as I stated, is that of a minister, right? I am a servant, right? Ministers are servants. They are not to be above the congregation, but below their congregation. Whether you have five members or 10,000, that you are the lowest of the lowest, that you are able to get down on your knees and begin to wash the feet of that 10,000 or wash the feet of that five that you have. You are a servant to Jesus Christ, right? You are not supposed to be above anybody. Carry your own books into the sanctuary, right? Drive your own car to the sanctuary. You don't need a butler or a limousine to take you to. Do you, right? You are a servant. You are the lowest of the lowest. That's what Paul is telling us today. Ooh, I can end this message right here. And I know a lot of ministers are going to be angry. But that's what this is all about. Carry your own books to the pulpit. You don't need five cars. You don't need this. You don't need that. Be a servant. Be the lowest of the lowest. Paul says, now, uh, uh, Colossae, I rejoice because I am a minister. I am a, yet a servant to Jesus Christ. Who? He, like many artists, right? And I'm going to get into this. Bear with me for a moment, right? And great writers, many artists and great writers of our time and of our past discovered their true gift. And they took their gift to change society, to change how the world looks at a piece of jewelry or a painting right, on a wall or a ceiling, right? How one reads and articulates a beautiful piece of poetry, right? And you know I'm going to read you a piece of poetry, right? Because that's what we're talking about, your true gift. How do you discover your true gift? How do you find the lowest, right? Something that you didn't think that you were good at doing, but yet you find and discover that this is the true gift that God has proclaimed and put upon you today. Ooh. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, right? Bear with me for a moment. So now I know why the caged bird sings. Hmm. So now I know why the caged bird sings. Ah, me. When his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he, when he beats his bars and he would be free, it is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings who or Langston Hughes a dream deferred I read this like 20 times finding out the difference trying to trying to figure out you know the deepness right what 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 is what is he trying to tell us what is Langston Hughes trying to tell us in this a dream deferred bear with me what happens to a dream deferred think about Paul y'all does it dry up like a raisin in the sun right or fester like a sore and then run does it stink like rotten meat or crushed and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Whew. What is your true gift, right? Paul is telling us that the dream, the hope in Jesus Christ has not been deferred. I'm speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ today. I am, an, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am a preacher. I am a servant of Jesus Christ today, Paul is saying. 
It came alive 60 years prior. The dream of Jacob seeing Christ, uh, 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 Abraham seeking Christ and Moses even telling us that one would come that would be greater than I. Right. The dream of salvation was realized. Right. It came to life by God through Christ in Christ. The dream realized in finding our reality in Christ Jesus. There is clarity in the dream of Christ. Right. It is made fresh. Through, uh, though Christ did die and was resurrected by God, the gospel message is as fresh as baked bread today. Many of you have been to Dillon's today in Hutchinson, Kansas, or in, or in Pratt, or or wherever. You know, when you, I, I got to go get some fresh stones. Kent knows what I'm talking about. Those fresh, fresh. When, when you hit the parking lot at Dillon's, right, you smell the fresh bread that has been baking all night. Donnell knows what I'm talking about. Kent knows what I'm talking about. Tracy and Shelby, all y'all know what I'm talking about. Larry Menace, how that icing, you, when you walk into the store, you, start, you begin to smell the icing and the, and the sugar, right? That is the freshness of the gospel message today, that when you, when you come into this place today, whether on the phone or into the sanctuaries in your own cities and towns and communities, that it is like fresh bread. Each and every day it has been renewed to us day by day. There is clarity. It is made fresh. The gospel message is sweet like honey, all right? Always has flavor as we find uh, in our salt for our meat, right? Always tastes good. Right. It is that scripture that says like the oil that streamed down the beard of Aaron. Don't make me cry right now. Who it is fresh each and every day on this day. It is fresher today than it was last week. What the church of Colossae must understand today. Right. So what should we take from this passage today as believers? Right. As we look at the church of Colossae and what Paul is trying to illustrate to this church as he is writing this letter to Epaphras, to the faithful believers and saints, as we stated last week of Colossae. Right. If anything, what we should take from this is without faith, it is impossible to please God. Number two, you have been justified through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that, whether you're in Jerusalem or in Asia Minor. And point three, there is no more sin that lives in you, right? Through Christ, you have been atoned of all of your sins, right? In other words, the reconciliation of God and humankind has been saved through the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That he died once and forevermore for everyone. He's not going to come back and do it again. He's done it one time, and that is it. So here we go. We're going to look at verses 24 through 29. I know many of you are saying, where is he going with this message today? But we are talking about the gifts, right? The gifts that we possess as believers and how we're supposed to tell others about the atonement, that you are now justified by faith through Jesus Christ, through his death, that you are now part of the kingdom of heaven as he told the church of Colossae last week. You are now heirs of heaven. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. I am a minister. I am a servant. I am ready to wash your feet, but I'm in these bonds in Rome. If I could ever get out of these bonds, I would come to Colossae and I would wash the feet of you saints to show you even a higher level of what it means to be a Christian. Verse 26, even the mystery which has been hid from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. You are now saints, right? Even though you were worshiping idols last week and even this morning, and now that you are crying with tears of joy because you have found Jesus Christ, now you are a saint. Woo. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And verse 29 says, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Hmm. I know I said a lot right there, but it simply means that if you've been saved, if you've been, uh, if God has since the beginning of time allowed you to, to hear and articulate and understand the message, right? The true message of being a believer that, that now you are saved by grace, right? 
he, it's, it's, it's almost like, wait a minute, I didn't know that I had this covering. I didn't know I had a, a, a blanket keeping me warm all these years, but uh, I, I, I guess he was carrying me. He was taking care of me. It's like the poem, The Footprints. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's then that I carried you, right? Uh, look back and see the footprints, right? It is then that I carried you. So last week we talked about the salutation of the Apostle Paul, right? To the church of Colossae. We, we learned about the love that Paul had for the church, for the believers. And not only that, but a faithful minister by the name of Epaphras, who was one that had been trained and taught by Paul the gospel of Jesus Christ in Rome. The impact that the gospel will have on the entire Mediterranean region and across the world will resonate from this letter to Colossae. Paul has assured the church at Colossae that, that what awaits them, even in their trials and struggles, is heaven above. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? One thing that we don't get excited about today, right, is when we got baptized, right? Me and my brothers, me and my uh, uh, two older brothers, my younger brother later on got baptized. But all three of my, uh, me and my two older brothers all got baptized at the same time. Second Baptist Church in Pratt, Kansas, right? And I remember putting on the choir robe and going up into that water and being baptized. And I, I was dead in Christ at the age of six or seven years old at that time being baptized. And then I became a new man. But now, years later, I won't give you my age, but years later, now I am, now I am justified and I understand now about the atonement of Jesus Christ. I didn't fully understand it then, but I, but I died in Christ then. We, we, we should celebrate. We should tell others about the day I got baptized, the day I walked down the aisle and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. What Paul is telling Colossae is like, hey, you have been dead in, you have been dead in Christ. Now your eyes have been enlightened, right? You are now alive in Christ Jesus. The people now are assured of salvation through their walk with Christ, right? Let me give you a brief overview. Now, if we look further into verses 9 through 13, it says we hear more of the testimony of Paul to the church and their important work. And now references them as saints, although they are non-Jew. The joy that awaits them is life eternal. Right. Can you imagine not getting this information if you're in Jerusalem? I mean, you're here from the Apostle Paul, the last person on the planet to actually to actually have seen Christ. The last person in the Bible to have seen Jesus Christ is Paul. And he's writing this letter. And in those verses 9 through 13, he's talking about bearing the fruit, the spreading of the gospel message. He's talking about endurance. He's talking about power. He's talking about patience. He's talking about joy. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about forgiveness of sins. This is the message that is being preached in Jerusalem by the, by the disciples. Paul is spending much time in preparing faithful Christians and saints in this, in this tremendous well-written letter. And then as we focus on 15 and 20, verses 15 and 20, be attentive to the creation story of Genesis 1 and John 1. When, you, when, when we get off this call, I want you to pay attention, right? Verses 15 to 20 is, is almost like uh, uh, Genesis 1. In the beginning, uh, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, right? Or John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. There was not anything made that was, that was not made by Him, right? Paul's focus is to enlighten the church on who Christ is. Not only is He your Savior, He is the creator of all things, things visible and invisible. All principalities and angels, I created all those things. All things were made uh, by Him, for Him, for His glory, and for our glory, and for our sakes. Who? Paul spends some time emphasizing the importance of the church, right? That the church of Colossae represents the body of Christ, that the body of Christ is all about joy and power and patience and redemption and forgiveness, right? And being non-judgmental to those in society. He talks about creation in 15 and 20. He talks about creation. He talks about heaven and earth and dominion. He talks about the church and he speaks about what? Reconciliation. All of these letters to Paul is all about reconciliation, being reconciled back to God. What happened in the, the fall of the garden in, in, in the book of Genesis, the fall from the garden. Now we have been reconciled, right? We can almost take out <laughs> all the books of the Bible. We can now just have Genesis and Revelation, right? And take out all the other uh, 64 books. I'm just, I'm just playing. But we have been reconciled by God, right? So all everything that the prophets and the kings did, right? It made sense, right? 
but it wasn't good enough. It didn't work out. People continued to turn their backs on God. Amen. So two key words we should glean so far from the book of Colossians, right? Is God's redemptive power and through his power, all are in all are in all now reconciled through Jesus Christ, right? That's a lot of two words, right? Two key words, right? Redemptive power, right? And reconciliation. Redemption and reconciliation. Redemption and reconciliation. If you run if you bump into anybody today, right, and they say, What was church all about today? You say redemption and reconciliation. Do you know Jesus Christ as part of your sins? Redemption and reconciliation. To the Church of Colossae, redemption and reconciliation. I'm with you in the struggle. So in other words, Paul is telling the church of Christ's supremacy and reminds them that, that once he was an apostle of Jesus, but as I stated, now I am a servant. I'm ready to, to gird up my loins, grab some water, and begin to wash your feet. Amen. So here we go. So in 24 through 29, in this section of scripture, Paul's tone is one of joy and struggle. Once again, as we, as we discussed last week, Paul wants to make it known throughout, throughout this letter that his love for Christ has abounded, right? And though he is in bonds, though he is suffering, he rejoices in knowing that his suffering will bring joy, right? That temporary suffering will bring eternal joy. The temporary suffering that we go through, right? That we're going through today that we think is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to go on and on and on forever. Yeah, there, we are going to have some trials and tribulations, right? As the, as the wind blows from the east, right? That we, we got to pay attention to the signs of the times. Things are occurring, right? That we will never have control over once again. Hmm. Christ has abounded. Paul knows that isolation will soon bring freedom. Paul knows that lack of understanding of his earthly purpose will bring eternal knowledge in knowing Jesus Christ. What he's trying to tell the church of Colossae is like, listen, you, 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 you probably don't know about the Torah. You probably don't know about the Pentateuch. You probably don't know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and, you, and you don't know about all the kings. You probably don't even know about David because you've been worshiping uh, all these idols. But I tell you this, you have been reconciled and, be, and been redeemed by Jesus Christ. You don't have to know about all that other stuff, all those other, all those other important events, right? You have been reconciled and heaven awaits you. Hmm. Verse 25 says that now I have been made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which means he has been exempted from the laws of the church. It means we have been exempted from the laws of the church. What that means is we are no longer held accountable, right, to the laws of, of Abraham and, 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 and what Moses was talking about, right? We are not held accountable to those hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of laws and, and things that people had to abide by, but only the Pharisees and the Sadducees seems to be the only ones that could abide by these laws. But even they couldn't keep it up, right? So we have been exempted from that, right? We have been exempted, right, from the ceremonial hand washings, right? It, has, it no longer has value to us, right? We have been exempted from the, the, the fastings, even though we do pray and fast, and we should pray and fast all the time, right? But now it wasn't like a requirement, okay? We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore, right, for the redemption of our sins. No longer a requirement for our salvation, no longer do we wait until Monday to do good while someone is lost, right? Or a lamb has fallen uh, in a well and needs to be saved. Well, I hope, you know, it's, it's Sunday. I can't do anything today. I've just put my hands in my pocket and I hope that lamb, I hope everything works out for that lamb. I won't be able to get to that lamb until Monday morning because God told me not to do anything on Sunday. Foolishness. No longer. You are exempted from that. So now we go... Uh, now in the name of Jesus Christ for the for though we were once lost we are now found and though we were blind now we see right uh, lame we now walk in the newness of life in Jesus Christ that's what Paul is trying to say that you are new that you have been uh, separated now from the rest of the world the, uh, the, the 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 things that occur in the world that that are going on around you you know you, you no longer have to be a part of those things you have been saved by grace right to fulfill the word of God, it appears that only through suffering for Christ's sake, get this, do we find fulfillment through Christ. When we suffer, when we go through what we're going through today, right? 
we actually find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. How and why? Well, if you fall to your knees each and every day and say, Lord, uh, can you make everything the way it was 12 months ago? Or, you know, can, can it be like it was, you know, where I don't have to wear a mask anymore? Or can it be like it was where all the, the hate mongering and all, everything that's going on in the world today, can you make all that stuff disappear? No, but I'll be with you through it. Hmm. In other words, we are like children in Christ Jesus. Actually, in 1 John 2 and 12, it says, John refers to us as little children, little children that have, that have been forgiven of sins by Jesus Christ. We are nothing but children in the sight of God. Like small children, we count on God, we depend on God, because as little children, we are unable to walk, amen, on our own. We cannot talk on our own, amen. Pray. We cannot pray on our own. We, can't, we cannot awaken ourselves on our own. We can't even turn over uh, in our beds on our own. Only through the grace of God can we stand in obedience to God and with God. Galatians 6 and, 6 and 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You think you did all this stuff by yourself? Got this job by yourself? Got this house by yourself? Hmm. Verse 26, even the mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And what Paul is trying to tell uh, the church of Colossae at that point, he says, when we focus on the secrets and the mysteries, right, the ancient of days, right? We can't leave out and dismiss the messianic secret from the book of Mark, right? What is the secret? What is the mystery of Christ, right? When we look at this gospel, the secret of the healing ministries, the casting out of demons, the, the healing of the blind, the lame, right, uh, are walking, the deaf and dumb are, are speaking and they are hearing. That is the mystery. What, what is the messianic secret in the book of Mark? Well, what he's trying to tell us is that uh, the only person that knew that Jesus Christ uh, was the son of God or that he was the Messiah in the book of Mark was the devil and the soldier at the crucifixion. 16 chapters, only two individuals knew that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. The mystery of Christ is found in Mark 1 and 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth, says the devil? Had you come to destroy us before the time? I know who you are. You are the Holy One sent from God. Only the devil knew who Jesus Christ was in the book of Mark and the soldier at the crucifixion. I know this must have been... Wait, there's something about this crucifixion. There's something different about this. There's earthquakes and how he died, right? And the things that he said and... Uh, how he forgave every one of their sins before he bowed his head and died. There's something different about this crucifixion. There was no uh, 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 exorbitant yelling and screaming, but a conversation not only to his mother and to, and to this young man by the name of John, right? But, 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 but he was forgiving of sins and he was uh, passing on authority of his sonship to a best friend. There's something different about this man. Hmm. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him? At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. The messianic secret. So from Tyre and Sidon to, to Capernaum, from Galilee to Jerusalem, the secret of Jesus Christ, the messianic secret that has now been hidden since the beginning of time, was what Paul is telling us, talking to us about, is now here. He's came and went and sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. All you need to do is accept him. The Messiah that the, prof, that the prophets and the kings had prayed and spoke about is now here. He left a gift to you. It's called the Holy Spirit. And he left it upon, the scripture says, upon all flesh. Hmm. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Powerful scripture. Hmm. 
What is the riches of his glory? First and foremost, life eternal. Woo. To partake of living water, right? To be, you, you don't have to thirst anymore. You don't have to cry anymore. To be more like Christ, to be in the presence of Christ, to have a new name in Christ. We will get new names, y'all. To be the envy of the world, of the angels. The angels are sitting back saying, who are these people? How could they do it? The riches of his glory. To know that you have lived and died in Christ Jesus and resurrected in his eternal glory. The riches of his glory. The riches of his grace. The riches of his mercy. To be more like Christ. To live in a dwelling place, not formed by hands, but made in the image of God, made for you. To receive a crown of life, the free gift, an award, well earned and well Receive, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against these things in dark places, in high places, well organized, well suited to destroy you, but only through God's grace and mercy you are able to stand. And as I begin to close, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man, get this, whom we preach. Whether it's Craig Finley at First Hicks or whether it's Philip Finley here in Sandy Springs, right? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whether you're a deacon like Larry Menace or it, it, it doesn't matter what what we preach, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man. Whether you're a preacher like Dean Finley, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 28 speaks of the importance of preaching and teaching this gospel magis, message, right? It is urgent. It is purposeful. It is, it, is, it, is, it is very urgent. It is necessary for all mankind. As you see and hear the things, the events happening on the news, right? And in social media, you're like, wait a minute, who's got a hold of this? No, no, no. The scripture says that, hey, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed down to Baal. There are more believers out there. There are unbelievers. This message is urgent. It's purposeful. We got to get out ahead of it, right? Jesus said, he told Mary and the disciples, hey, listen, go back and tell the disciples and Peter, meet me in Galilee. Jesus Christ is always a million steps ahead of everybody else. Amen. There are no shortcuts, right? Paul is saying there are no shortcuts, nor, are there an, uh, nor is there an easier way of coming into the full knowledge of Christ, only that you accept him as your Lord and Savior. He is waiting for you and he loves you. There's a crown of righteousness waiting for you if you just accept and believe in him. It's just that easy. In other words, as the gospel message is being preached, it is heard, it is received. And for all those that believe, you are now found perfect in Christ Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, right? Though your sins be as scarlet, now they are white as snow. Should we continue in sin? No, God forbid. Meaning that no more does God see you as faultless. You are now free from defect and error. You have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. In verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I just, I just, I just hope that everyone meditates on this. Go into your, go into your prayer closet and meditate on these verses, right? This is powerful. Whereunto I also labor. I, I, Epaphras, Church of Colossae, I am laboring, right? Even though I'm in these bonds, right? The message of God, the Holy Spirit, is being written by hand, by me. I am striving according to the workings, the inner workings of Jesus Christ, right? It worketh in me, what? Mightily, right? This is no plaything. I'm not sitting here writing on my behalf, right? It is the Holy Spirit that is revealing these things to me that I may be able to, uh, uh, be able to explain to you, to tell you about the inner workings of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us in verse 29 that his purpose in life is to work tirelessly for Jesus Christ, which is found and is working in him. Paul told us in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed, Donnell, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm here to testify on behalf of Jesus Christ. I'm an attorney for Jesus Christ today. Though I am sitting here, standing in front of this building with my beautiful wife and this water, I am standing here with the angels looking down upon us saying, Lord Jesus, this man is preaching today. He loves you. Oh, yes, I do. 
The church of Colossae, like our church and all churches, needs to realize that the same gospel message that has been preached across the Mediterranean is the same message that has been preached across North and South America, Asia, India, Africa, Antarctica, North. It doesn't matter. It's the same gospel message. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That is written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And how do we get there? How do we get this just, right? How do we get faith? Well, we have to pray. We have to pray continuously. The scripture said that we pray continuously without, without resting, that, that, that we pray continuously, right? Paul, in his letter to Colossae, as I close, and to this faithful minister of Epaphras, says that whether in Jerusalem or across this region, faith is man's only way toward salvation. That we must have faith and that we must have hope. Remember, right, when you feel weak or you feel that, wait, God, you're not listening to me or you're too busy and I know you're not handling my situation. You're not paying attention to what's going on in my life. Oh, yes, he is. He's way out ahead of you. Meet me in Galilee. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We are the just. Church of Colossae, you are the saints, right? Uh, heaven awaits you. Uh, reconciliation and redemption awaits you, right? Put away those dumb idols, those things that, that give you temporary happiness or pleasure, right? In your communities. Get rid of those things. Redemption awaits you reconciliation in my conclusion so what should we take from this passage today as I stated without faith it is impossible to please God or even to see God you have been justified through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ there is no more sin that lives in you through Christ you have been atoned of all of your sins in other words reconciliation of God and humankind has been saved through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ so now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you Kent faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore Amen. Amen and amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you once again for the Church of Colossae, which is but an example of, of, of our churches today. For you are telling the Church of Colossae that there is one body, and that body is of Jesus Christ. Now, the body may have many parts, but Colossae, the Church of Colossae, you are part of that body. You are part of that, part of that eternal body of Jesus Christ. It all works together whether it's the hand or the foot, whether it's the head or the eyes, that we all work together as one body in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel message that has been preached today. And I pray that someone's heart will be transformed and that uh, their way of thinking, that, they, that, that, that now I have been atoned, me, right? Through the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, that now I have access to heaven? Yes, to all those that believe, right? For we are justified by faith. And let us continue to pray anxiously, right? Praying for our enemies. Praying for those who have despitefully used us. Those who, who, who hate us the most, pray for the most. Bless us and keep us. Forgive us of our sins. Watch over us. And we will be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the grace, Lord Jesus. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. May God bless you and keep you on this day. We will continue on. Now we'll uh, get into the meat of the Church of Colossae. What was the issue, right? What Paul is telling the Church of Colossae is that, wait a minute, I'm, I'm writing all these beautiful things about Jesus Christ, but now let me tell you what your problem is that Epaphras has explained to me. And once you get over this hurdle in your life, once you get over this hurdle in your life, this problem that's going on in your church, God will bless you, right? So that's what we're going to get into next week. What is the issue? What is the problem? Why is this letter even written? So may God bless you and keep you. Be safe on today. Thank you for joining. May God bless you and keep you. Take care. I love each and every one of you. Take care. Bye-bye.